Welcome to our continuing series of interviews with prominent Leonians. I'm your host, Bill Ziegler, and today I am very pleased to introduce our special guest, Bob Klappersch. Bob, it's great to see you. Uh, at the risk of, of embarrassing you a little bit, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to share some biographical background. Please embarrass me. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> you got it. So uh, for those of you who don't already know, uh, Bob is a, uh, a sports writer. And he has written for the New York Post, the New York Daily News, the New York Times, the New York Star Ledger, ESPN, Fox Sports, and the Bergen Record. And uh, uh, not only is he a sports writer, but he's a really good sports writer. Uh, one of my favorites, and I'm pleased to have him today on, uh, on our interview. The purpose of this interview, as uh, I think we've said before, but it bears repetition, is we want to give people an opportunity in the future to get a better idea of what some prominent Leonians like Bob were like and uh, what they have done and what some of their memories of Leonia are. So uh, very pleased to, to have you today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm holding in my hand two props. Um, uh, the first, Inside the Empire, which is a book about the 2018 New York Yankees. Uh, this no small feat, New York Times bestseller. So congratulations on that. And then one of my all-time personal favorites, the, uh, the worst team money could buy, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And I think this was one of your first. This was the first. The first book. Yes. Uh, the 1992 Mets. Right. And one of the one of the things that come, there's several things that come out of this, uh, but and I want to explore with you. But there was a bit of a kerfuffle between you and one of the stars at the time, Bobby yes. Bonilla. So we yeah. will talk about that. Okay. Uh, a little later, but I, I want to explore first what we definitely have in common. Uh, you grew up in Leonia, I grew up in Leonia. You played baseball in Leonia, you know, for our varsity team. You went on to play uh, baseball for Columbia University, right. uh, their varsity team. You were a pitcher for, for the team, correct? You wrote for the Columbia Spectator, right. the Daily, um, and you obviously graduated from Columbia, but with a political science degree, which somewhat surprised me because I thought for years that you were a journalist. It surprised me too. <laughs> so let's, let's go back. We'll, we'll start with uh, some memories of Leonia. If you were to think about Leonia as you were growing up, what, what made Leonia special to you as a, as a young man growing up? And then, then we'll talk a little bit about the high school baseball experience. And it's funny, I, my, my recollections of Leonia seem to get warmer and warmer the older I get. I think everybody like, wants to go back and relive the best days of their lives. The older you are, the better it feels to have been 25 or 20 or 15. Because I'm constantly relooping the memories of Leonia, going to the swimming pool during the day or going to Wood Park at night. The lazy, comfortable, safe, warm summers. I think more than anything, I remember the summers. And I really didn't appreciate Leonia at the time, like we all do. We don't appreciate something until it's in the rearview mirror, right? So it's when I moved, after I graduated from Leonia High School and I was living in Columbia, living in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, that I slowly started to appreciate what I had as a teenager in Leonia, and even younger than that. It's just, it was a remarkable, tight-knit community that everybody knew each other, that everybody liked each other. It was this amazing harmony, um, even in school, I mean, the things that are going on socially now just didn't seem to exist back then. I mean, there was this, the social fabric of Leonia amongst my friends, my parents and their friends seemed to be so simple, and so pure. And again, I don't know how much of it is just the filter of nostalgia. My own, my own recollection, recollection is colored by wanting to be that young again, but it was sure a great time. It really was. And uh, one, of the, one of the constants in your life has always been athletics. You were always interested in sports. Uh, I want to I want to kind of zero in on baseball, which I think was your preferred sport all right. along. Uh, you played high school ball. You had as your coach a bit of a young legend himself, who I don't think a lot of people know or hear enough about. But Ed Meese, can the greatest? Can you tell me a little bit about Ed Meese and your your recollection of him? He was one of those larger than life characters. I mean, you know, I know so much about baseball now. I mean, baseball is my life, it's my profession. I still play it in an 18 and up league. I mean, obviously it's, it's an obsession I haven't let go 
ago. And Ed Misi wasn't a great technical coach, but he was so beloved by the players. I mean, we loved the man. I mean, and you don't see that kind of connection anymore at any level where players just seem to bond with the guy. You play for the guy, for the, for the coach, and we did. Uh, we had a really good team in 1974. We had a really excellent team in 75. And there's a great story behind the 75 lines. Um, if we want, I can go into it. Or sure. No, I, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't that, mind that, at all. I, I mean, all the years of playing together, it all sort of came together in 75. All our best players were seniors. So we knew that this was it for us in the BCS on National. I was the captain of the team. I was a pitcher. And I also played first base. And all of us were at our high school athletic proms, primes. So we were fighting with Palisades Park for the league title. Came down to the last game of the year, and they beat us four to two. Mm. We finished second, and what was left, which we were denied at the time, was the county tournament. That was the next step. Sixteen teams, top sixteen teams, were invited as invitational, and the tournament, because Palisades Park had won, they invited the Tigers. Through whatever mishap or clerical error, they did not get the application in on time. So they went and they selected Leonia. Mm -hmm. It was caused such an uproar. Palisades Park said, no, 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 we're the champs. We deserve to be in. And Ed Misi's response was, so Willie Moresco, he was the coach at Palisades Park. And Misi said, sorry, too late, we're in. So we were seated number 16, the last seed in Bergen County. We're a good team, but there were 15 teams that were better than us. And lo and behold, they seated us against number one, Richfield Park. Mm -hmm. They were like the 98 Yankees of Bergen County at the time. They were two-time state champions. I mean, they were just a machine. Right. And we had played them early in the season, and they beat us 16 to nothing. That's how much better they were than us. And again, we were a good team. Right. They were just at another level. So we played the tournament. The first round of the tournament was played at Fairleigh Dickinson. And um, John Schwarman started that game. Ed Nisi's idea was to start Schwarman. He had the line, he had me on the bench to come in relief. He didn't need me in relief because it was a close game. Somehow we'd stay in a close game. It's three to two in the top of the seventh. We're down three to two. Yeah. And they have the one of their, they played their, used their second best pitcher, Rich Garcia. Not their number one state, their number one state, number one in the state pitcher, Matt McGarrow. They held them back thinking that they would just roll over the young I would have done the same thing if I was there. So in the seventh inning, Ed Meese with a run on first and second, Meese says, go get a bat, you're gonna pinch it. Now I'm a left-handed hitter and this guy Garcia, who I'm still friends with to this day, he's throwing gas. And I get up there, I'm not ready, I'm cold, I'm ice cold. First pitch strike, and the guy felt like he was throwing 98 miles an hour. He wasn't. Of course, but, you know, at the time, and the, most, the kind of anxiety. A lot of stress. A lot of stress, right? Our season's on the line. We lose this game. It's an elimination. We lose it. We're done. We're done. We're graduating. That's the end of the only baseball. So he throws me a curveball. He just misses, and I didn't see it well. It's lefty on lefty. I did not get a good look, and I said, I'm really in trouble. If he, he's got to throw me another curve. I hope he hangs it, because that's my only shot. He throws a curveball. He hangs it. I literally stuck my bat out, and I blooped a little ball, a little base hit over shortstop, two runs score. We go on to win the game. We go on to win the game, which is probably the biggest upset in Burton County tournament history. They could not believe that they lost to Leonia. <laughs> and I remember the record, the Bergen record was covering the game. John Rowe was covering the game, who I went on to work with for 17 years. I, I, Always used to kid him, John, you must be as old as a stony covered <laughs> me when I was 17 in high school. Anyway, John wrote the story and he's interviewing Ed Meese. He goes, how did you guys do it? How did you beat Richfield Park? And Ed and, and Meese's famous words were, you know what? I don't care if we ever win another game. <laughs> this is great. And we didn't because we all graduated. In the next three years, Leon's record was like 0-20, 0-20. It was a prophecy. We didn't win another game. But I don't know if he, I don't know if he really minded because we beat Richfield Park and we had that forever memory, forever. I still think about that. I, I think that's a wonderful story, and thank you for sharing because it, it speaks to Leon, it speaks to who you are and how excited you are, and and with that sort of energy behind baseball and interest, you you did something that is pretty difficult to do. You started to think at some point about this being a profession more than just a a. Uh, athletic release. Right. When did that happen in your thought process? When I got to college, uh, I thought I was going to be a lawyer, and that lasted one day or one week. <laughs> That's why I was a political science major. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. No. But you stuck really, with poli sci. I stuck with poli sci. I ended up taking more courses in American history. I could have just switched it to, right, to American history. But 
really my passion is baseball. I made the, the, the team at Columbia. It was a good team. And I was starting to develop physically. I was getting bigger and stronger. I was able to compete at the college level. And I really liked writing sports. I love sports. I had an, uh, an aptitude for writing. I was working on the high school paper at Leonia. So I kind of just merged those two interests. And at some point, maybe in my sophomore year at Columbia, I knew I wasn't going to get drafted. I was a good amateur player, a good college player, right. but I was definitely a run or two below draft level. So I knew that if I was going to continue on baseball, I was going to be writing about it. And I had set my sights on working for the New York Post because that was the number one sports paper. It was. In the, in the city. Everybody. Everywhere. I mean, the Post was sports. Yeah. And I really, I really wanted to become a sports writer. And so I kept my baseball career going all the way through senior year at Columbia. Uh, played against Ron Darling when he was at Yale. Played against John Franco and Frank Viola when they were at St. John's. I pitched against all of them. And then when I graduated, um, and you struck out Ron Darling. I struck out Ron Darling. To this day, he denies it. He says, "Let's." <laughs> I got some video. I said, "Ron, there's no video back there." It's like OJ saying, "You know, I'm going to find the real killer." No, you got to take my word for it. I struck you out. Because I remember in the dugout, we were all laughing about the little skinny shortstop with the funny yeah. name. Ron Darling, who's he? <laughs> so, yes, Ron and I are, are great friends to this day. And we still joke about that, the phantom strike, which he doesn't believe happened. But um, when I graduated from Columbia, I really, I wanted to be a, a, a sports writer. I was a sports writer. So you I knew I'm going to be a sports writer. I knew I'm going to be a baseball sports writer. That's exactly what I wanted. And I want to work for the New York Post. So right. what was the big break? They got you to the post because that's not an easy no, win. It was, no, I was home for six months. I had moved back from Colombia back to Leonia, jobless, right? 22 years old, would sleeping until noon every day, going out with my friends. And my father would stand at my door every morning. Was what are you going to do with your life? When are you going to go get a job? And like in his, in his mind, I was, I was somehow, you know, I was pulling a fast one on him. <laughs> he wanted me to go. He didn't care. I was a sports writer or anything. He wanted me to just get on with my yeah. life. And here I am living an extended college life. Yeah, I but think what he I was, wanted you off the payroll, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, he had college loans and he couldn't wait to just offload on me. Right. So all the while, I was calling the New York Post literally three times a week, calling to speak to Greg Gallo, the sports editor, who was actually the son of Bill Gallo, the Daily News cartoonist. Right. So I'd call, and of course, he wasn't available. He's not in. Can we take a message? This went on literally for weeks and months until one day I called. And instead of the secretary, a man answered. I said, hello, is Greg Gallo there? And he said, speaking. Whoa. <laughs> okay, this is my moment. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't even prepared, but somehow I had the presence of mind to say, oh, Mr. Gallo, this is Bob Clappish. I uh, just recently graduated from Columbia. I don't know if you remember, but we spoke about two weeks ago. He said to give you a call back. Of course, we never had that conversation. <laughs> I completely made that up. And he was too embarrassed to say he didn't remember. And he goes, uh, yeah, 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 Bob, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, we may have an opening. Can you come in tomorrow and talk to me and the other editors? Said, yeah, yeah, of course. And I showed up the next morning, and they said, okay, you're hard. So that it was, was like lightning strike. It was, it was like an act of God. Right. Like, to, first of all, for me to even think of that, for there to be, for Gallo to have answered the phone, for there to have been an opening. I mean, now, I was at the bottom of it. The bottom okay. barrel, the lowest rung. Which I'm sure you didn't mind. No, I, was, I wasn't even writing for two years. I was a clerk. I was answering phones, sorting mail, buying lunch, you know, at the cafe. Yeah, it sounds like an intern. And they really enjoyed, like, humiliating the Ivy League. You know? <laughs> oh, so you think you come out of Ivy League, you think you're going to actually get a columnist job? No, go buy me lunch. I was abused by all the, you know, the blue-collar guys at the Post. But I learned a lot. You know, I learned a lot about newspapers, real newspapers. And then finally, I got my break covering... The first, my first assignment was covering the Cosmos, the New York Cosmos. So you got that break because what happened? Somebody was... Well, they decided, they, they could see that I could write a little bit. You know, they looked at my clips. Obviously, um, I was interested, motivated. I was, I was really not going to quit on them. I was going to stick it out. So they gave me, they sent me to a couple games. There was nobody covering the Cosmos. They created that slot for me. Right. And, you know, I held my own a little bit. My mother is Brazilian, so I could speak Portuguese with some of the Cosmos. Which, was, which really helped. And then they sent me to a couple college basketball games to cover that. I sort of faked my way through that. I'm not a big basketball fan, but I did that. And then 1983, the Mets were really terrible. There was an opening. Henry Heck at the time was leaving to go to Sports Illustrated. And they said, okay, here's your shot. 
go out there and start covering the Mets. And that's how it began. I, I would love to. I want to unpack that a little bit for sure because um, one of the things that comes through in this book is how difficult it is uh, when teams aren't doing well to get stories. Right. And you had the added task of establishing your own bona fides as a baseball sports writer at a time when a lot of people weren't really turned on by the, you know, the Mets. Um, so how, how did you cultivate your relationships with select athletes so you could get stories? Because I, I did get the impression you worked hard at it. And I also got the impression from reading this book that the athletic quotient that you, you call it in this book that you brought to the table, meaning that you had some natural athleticism and maybe the players could relate to you, also helped you cultivate relationships. So how did that come together for you? Uh, well, you have to understand, first of all, the 83, 84 Mets were bad. In 83, 84, they started to get good. Oh, you right. could see that something was building there, right? Okay. They replaced all the old players from the old regime from the late 70s and early 80s with a much younger and more athletic crew. So now we're talking about 84. Mm -hmm. You know, the players, you know, Ron Darling was there, and Lee Dykstra was coming, and Very Kevin good. Elster, that whole nucleus, Strawberry, Gooden. There's players in their mid-20s, right? Now suddenly the writer from the New York Post, me, is in his mid-20s. We're all single. And in the 80s, how do I say this? It was a lot different than it is today. I tell my kids today, you know, it was a lot easier to date in the 80s than it is today. It was a wild time in New York City. You go out to the bars, you can meet anybody you want, right? And I was, I became socially closer to the players because A, I was the same age. I was single, I was a ball player. I was covering a team that was doing well. Everybody was happy with the coverage. And there was sort of this symbiotic relationship, which does not exist today. Not in a million years does this job of sports writer resemble what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Now there's, it's the divide is as wide as it's ever been. But back then, the players liked the writers writers like the players, everybody liked each other. We were all part of the same entertainment and you could hang product out. and you could hang out. We were all in the same Was circuit. that true for the other sports writers too? Or or you were sort of a little different because you Me were and, and Tom Reducci, who is now, you know, a superstar. I mean he's at Sports Illustrated, he's at MLB Network, and it's on Fox. He's had quite a career. But back then he had just graduated from Penn State and he was working at Newsday. So he and I were the same age. He also played baseball. So we had we both sort of sort of came from the same mold. And we hung out with the players. That made my job so much easier because back then, baseball writing was about covering the clubhouse. It was not about covering the industry. It was not covering agents. It's not covering general managers. It's it wasn't about roster construction. It wasn't about saber metrics. It was about stories that were generated by the players themselves. So if you were close to Darren Strawberry, if you liked you, if you trusted you, you were guaranteed a story a day, a good story that could end up on the back page of the post and. Back then, people actually read the newspaper to find out what was going on with the team. There was no internet, right? There was no social media, no Instagram, nothing. Your connection as a fan to the baseball players, to the team, was through the New York Post, or the New York Daily News. So I became the go-between. So it was a great job at, at a great time in New York, in Major League Baseball. And I look back on that, it really was the golden era of journalism. I tell young sports writers today what my job was like then, what the job was like then. And they look at me like I'm describing the lost city of Atlantis. It's right. just so different. So I'm glad that I was the age I was, I was covering the baseball at the time I was, that the Mets were really great at that time. I, I've had such a good time. I, unfortunately, that, that time came to an end. It, it, they peaked to about 88 when they lost the Dodgers, and then it went slowly downhill until you get to 92, 93, which is really the focus here. And it was, it was everything that the Mets had done right as a front office, uh, at, the at the executive level, they started making one mistake after another. They broke up that team, and they broke up the formula. They thought the Mets were too wild and too crazy, which they were, but they were also really good. And they brought in a number of out-of-towners who were talented, but just didn't belong socially, just culturally. They were just not cut out for New York. And I remember 92, they brought in Bobby Bonilla, Brett Saberhagen, Vince Coleman, Eddie Murray. On paper, it was a dynamite team and a new manager, Jeff Torborg. And they were trying to recreate the David Johnson Mets, the Strawberry and Darling. And 
and it didn't work. Close. No, these guys came from out of town, and they hated New York. They hated the press. They hated the fans. They were here just for the money. Yeah. And that book is a diary of that season, and also an explanation of what the job was like. Again, everybody I ever met, I told them what I did for a living. I mean, I'm talking about lawyers, doctors. What's it like? What's your job like? What's so and so like? Tell me anything. Because well, that comes that's through loud and clear in this book. And that's what it's one is. of the reasons why I really enjoyed this book. Um, you tell an anecdote in this very early in your career where you were tested by Tom Seaver yeah. in the locker room. Yeah. Can you can you share that? Yeah. yeah. This was that was my very first spring training. This was '83. Now I really, really was new on the beat. Nobody knew me, and I grew up as a Mets fan. And I have to admit. You know, as a, my first major assignment, this is like spring training of my first year. So literally the first time I had any exposure to any of the Mets. So I'm in St. Petersburg. Back then the Mets trained in St. Pete, not before they moved to support St. Lucie, Florida. I'm in the locker room. The, play, the players are already on the field. The drills had already begun. The other reporters were on the field. And I'm kind of like wandering around lost because I really didn't know where to go, where I should be. I'm in the clubhouse. <laughs> and I see Tom Seaver. He has come in from the trainer's room to sit down in his locker. And I'm a little awestruck. I mean, it's Tom Seaver, right? I mean, I remember him from 69 and like he was a legend. I'm like, oh man, it's Tom Seaver. Now, the idiot that I am, I was sitting in, I don't know why I was doing this. I was reading a newspaper and a lot. I should have been on the field watching the team practice, but I'm sitting in the, in the clubhouse reading a newspaper. Seaver comes sit down right next to me, doesn't say a word, just grabs the newspaper out of my hands and starts reading it. And I think, wow. First of all, it's Tom Seaver is sitting right next to me. Second one, he just took the newspaper out of my hands. How dare he? How rude. So Seaver doesn't say a word. I don't even know if he's reading the paper so much as waiting for me to respond. So I have two options. One, I could say nothing. I could walk away and pretend it didn't happen, and it would be our dirty little secret that he intimidated the rookie from the New York Post. Right. And look, he probably wouldn't blame me if I did that. He knew that I was, you know, really nervous. But I'm also an athlete still in my mind, you know, and I don't think I'm gonna let anybody intimidate me. So I go to option two, which is to grab a newspaper out of his hand. Now I'm the one sitting there reading it. And he loved it. He looked at me and he goes, this guy must have some stones. He slaps, he slaps me on the thigh, he goes, well done, young man. And he got me and walked away. And we never mentioned it again. But ever after that, every day after that day, he was very, very friendly to me. Because he realized, that I was not going to be intimidated. And you were going to stand up for I'm going to stand up. And I always tell this anecdote to young journalists in high school and college. You know, if there's anything I can tell you about this job, is to never be afraid. Even if you're sitting next to an icon who's just ripped the newspaper out of your hands. Right. I think that's, uh, it, it's a great story. And and your career really did take off. It I did. mean, you can take six books now. Yeah. Um, you've seen baseball change in, in big ways. Yeah. You know, this this last book about the New York Yankees, you in order to pull that together, in order for that to become a bestseller, you had to have unprecedented access to a handful of key executives right. with the Yankees. How did you cultivate those kinds of relationships? Because they're not the athletes, they're in the front office. Right. Well, the backstory to that is I had been at the Bergen Record um, for 22 years at that point. And that's when the, the Borg family sold to Gannett. Right. And Gannett's formula is to lay off anybody who's over the age of 40 or making more than $40,000 a year is to really basically dumb down the local papers and make it a, a smaller version of USA Today. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, the Bergen Record was a great, great periodical growing up in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It was. And even in the 90s. Great local news, too. No more. And it was a player in the New York market when it came to sports. It was a great destination to be. I was there for 20 years, and I wouldn't have stayed that long if I didn't think it was worthy or worthwhile. It was a great place to be. And I had been in the Post and Daily News at that point. I was really happy with the record. But Gannett came and they laid me off. They laid everybody off. There was nobody left. Yeah. So here I am now going, this is after the World Series in 17, so I'm going to the 18th season thinking, if I'm ever going to do something different, it's now. It's, this is my chance. And I paired up with a Rolling Stone author, a friend of mine, Paul yeah. Salatarov, who's a great, great writer and a big sports fan. And we've been talking about doing something together. Yeah. And this was our shot. Let's write about the Yankees. Because that's also the off-season where the Yankees acquired Giancarlo Stanton. 
So now they've got Judd and Sand together, and the Yankees sold half a million. Which was a really interesting story. In this book, great, how that happened. It was a great story, backstory about how Jeter, Jeter, who's you know, one of the owners now in Miami, yeah. had a little tiff with Stanton and ended up sending him to New York. Right. And how Cashman pulled off that. You know, Cashman trade. played it perfectly. Yeah. But there's so much enthusiasm for the Yankees that, that Windsor, they sold a half a million tickets before camp had even opened. Right. So I say to Paul, we were planning to do it the year after. Paul and I said, you know what? There's a lot going on right now. Let's do this book now. But to be able to do this book, to really write how this team became Brian Cashman's team as opposed to George Steinbrenner's team, there's been a great transition. The business model has changed exponentially. I went to Cashman and I said, look, I want to write the story from the ownership perspective. It's not just going to be a diary of a baseball season. I did that with the 92 Mets. I don't want to write just that. Right. I want to write about And how it's clear that this last book, the 2018 Yankees, is very different in that way. Oh, it's, it's a not much different It's a much, right, right. It's a different book. It's a different team. It's a different era. And a different perspective. It's totally. a management perspective. And I said, I, I can't do this book without your say-so, without you giving me access. And I'm talking about you, Randy Levine, the team president. I've got to be able to sit down with Hal Steinbrenner. I want to write this. I want to be embedded. I'm not going to work for a newspaper this year if I do this book. And I, I'm going to tell the players, oh, you see that group of reporters in the corner scrambling to make deadline. That has been me for 20 years, but not this year. Right. So I'm able to, I told these players, you can let your hair down and talk to me because what you say is not going to end up on the back page of the post tomorrow. Right. This is going to be next year. It's like writing a book about a presidential election that comes out the year after this. And, and were the players receptive to they that? They were very receptive. They were actually re loving the idea that someone was actually listening to them and not trying to get a soundbite to put up on Twitter. So this is almost like a historian in their clubhouse, and they really appreciate it. But even so, if Cashman had not said, I've talked to you, there would have been no book. And Cashman said, all right. I said, because everyone has given credit to Joe Torre, to Derek Jeter, to George Steinberg, even Alex Rodriguez, but nobody's told the story of you how you have made this team a perennial winner. No one has told that yet, and you haven't let anybody tell it. I want to tell it. I said, Brian, you've known me since 98. I see you every day, and I'm telling you that your story is underappreciated. I want to write it. And he said, okay. And that's how the book was launched. It was really smart, and clearly the timing was right, and the perspective was right, because the reaction to it, becoming a bestseller pretty quickly. Right, the first week was out. Yeah, it was out, and, and it, was, it was such a different book. And there's so many different perspectives in the book about how baseball is played now and how the business model, as I said, how the business model has, has changed. Right. You know, it definitely does not appeal to as much to older fans, the way the game is played today. It's much more of a young person's sport. It's, as a, as a spectator, I'm talking about the games right. now are, are consumed electronically, yes. on social media, through software. I mean, the days of going to Yankee Stadium, having a hot dog and beer and keeping score on with pencil that's and a scorebook, that, yeah. that's over. Yeah. I mean, that's over. I used to love doing that, but yeah. so did I. I don't see a lot of people doing that's that. That's not how sports are consumed these days, and that's not how it's written about. If today's sports writers are immersed in, in statistics, advanced analytics, roster construction, it's about money, but the story that's told about the players, by the players, the human interest is, is, is to me, is almost extinct. How, I just don't get that anymore. How did the, um, after the book came out, now it's a bestseller, how did Brian, how did Brian Cashman and Randy Levine and Hal Steinbrenner feel that they were represented? Because one of the things that is, is sort of a, a difficult role to hold, I think, is the balance that you have to strike between your sources and their perspective. And when you put things together and analyze it, how it actually is, how you've interpreted it. Sometimes there can be some animosity. My impression is that they were pretty cool with what you wrote. Randy Levine, who is a sort of a modern day George Steinbrenner. I mean, George actually hired him yeah. to help build the S network in the stadium, all the legal stuff. Randy Levine had been a deputy mayor in New York City and worked for the Justice Department. He's not a baseball man, but he's a real high, strong, high power business politician and businessman. And he sort of assumed role of George, has the same demeanor, has the same explosive temper. You don't want to be on the wrong side of one of his phone calls when he's mad at you. Yeah. But he was very helpful as well. He loved the book. Good. Hal liked the book. Cashman said it took him two years to read it. 
because he said, I'm just, I just, I just can't read it. I, I can't read it. What if it's no good? I said, what if it's no good? I just got on the New York Times bestseller and said, Carl, like, you a genius. Read it. And he finally did read it. Um, I'd like to thank you very much. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to say we sat down on four different occasions for two hours each. So we have eight hours of tape of Brian. And if Brian, if you know Brian, he likes to talk. And if he trusts you, he's unfiltered completely. He'll say exactly what he thinks. He has like a zero BS uh, gauge on him. He just does not make small talk. He tells you exactly what he thinks. So as a favor to him, I went through all, all the, uh, the transcripts and I said, Brian, we're sitting down to write this book. And there are 10 quotes here, which I know you, you're going to look at these quotes and your hair's going to be on fire if you see it in print. And I'm going to give you a chance to take a look and tell me if you really want this in the book or not. And he, here's number one. Oh my God. Here's number two. <laughs> Did I say that on the record? I said, yeah, Brian, it's on tape. Number three. No, 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 please don't put that in the book. The whole first nine, out. Number 10, he leaves in. And even number 10, he says, right. I should have never told him left that in. It happened right. telling, it happened to be an anecdote about Andy Pettit who had left the Yankees in 2003, played three years with the Astros, and came right. back in 2006. So it was one day on the mound early in the 06 season. It's a ground ball up the middle. And Pettit thinks, okay, Jeet's got that. Derek's got it. And this is Pettit talking. I look over my shoulder, and Jeter's nowhere close to it. He goes, oh, my God, Jeet can't play anymore. And he told this to Cashman, and Cashman recounted it to me, and it's in the book. He goes, that's in the book? I said, yeah, you left it in. He goes, I should have never. <laughs> I read that in the book. <laughs> well, I mean, for any pet to say Jeter can't play anymore? Yeah. Wow. That, that's a little bit explosive. Yeah. Um, so they, the management, really appreciated the book. Yeah. Brian and Randy, um, uh, how sometimes, as in this book, uh, you're telling the truth and quoting people accurately will result in... Uh, the opposite, some anger, uh, some rage. And with Bobby Bonilla in 92, I understand that's exactly what happened after the book came out and yeah. he confronted you yeah. in the locker room. Yeah. That is still on the ESPN's top 10 all time writer, reporter, writer, player, dust ups. I think we're number six on the yeah, all time it was, list. It was more than a kerfuffle. Oh, it was pretty bad. It started, it started with the spring training. This is actually 93. The book is about the 92 Mets. The book came out in 93. So the last week of spring training, I went up to Jeff Torbrook and I said, Jeff, this book is coming out next week. And I want you to know it's fair, tough, but fair. So please don't take anything personally. Don't take it personally. He goes, Bob, thank you for telling me. I know how it is in the city. I've been, you know, I used to coach with the Yankees. I know what this is about. I know the deal. Thank you for telling me. No worries. Okay, so the book comes out, and of course, the Mets hate the book, right? Because it's really an homage to the old 80s, That's the late right. 80s team, That's not right. a bunch of clowns who were ruining the franchise in 92 right. and 93, so they hate the book. I walk into the clubhouse on a Saturday morning, I think it's the first Saturday in April. I walk in the clubhouse, and there's Bobby Bonilla at the other side of the, this is before Bad Times, this is early on a Saturday, there's Bobby Bonilla on the other side of the room, and he says really loud, well, look who just walked in here. You, blunt one. He goes, oh yeah, but don't take it personally. I said, uh-huh. Somebody's been done. Somebody has been prepared for this. So the, some, there's a conspiracy word. going on in here. And um, Jay Horowitz, he was the, who was the PR guy. guy, realizes that there's a real problem here. He closes the clubhouse, which he was not allowed to do. Media's allowed to stay in at that time until an hour before first pitch. This is like 10.30. Clubhouse is closed. So everyone leaves. Obviously, there's a problem. I'm up in the press box throughout the game. Everyone's coming up to me saying, are you going back down there? Are you going back down there? Said, of course I'm going back down. How could I not go back down? Look, if I could stand up to Tom Seaver, I'm going to go back down to that clubhouse, see what everybody has got for me. Because I knew something was about to happen, right? This was bad. So Mets play the Astros that day. They lose. Gooden is pitching. He loses. So I come down to the clubhouse, and just before I set foot in there, I take a deep breath. I said, okay. So you knew something. Oh, I knew, believe me. Yeah, I said, okay, whatever's about to happen, it's going to happen now. I walk in the room, and he's back at his lock. And he goes, look at this, the blank and blank is back for more. Come on, man, you're back for more? Let's go. 
Now, it just so happens, look, my play is to ignore it. I've got to take it. I've got to swallow my pride and not say well, you're a professional. I'm a professional. I know this you know, the clubhouse is, is, not the, is not like the Boy Scouts, right? Just, this is part of the deal. So I say nothing. But it just so happened that Gooden, who pitched that day, and the press conference, the press gathering was at his locker, was only two lockers away from Bonilla's locker. So now Bonilla's working on me from about 10 feet away. We're not across the room from each other. We're about the same distance as you and me. So I mean, he really let me have a steady stream of insults. Come on, man. He's trying to engage. Oh, come on. And he didn't realize that this whole time there was a camera in the club. I said at the time there was one camera from New, from New York One. And he's saying, come on, man, make your move. Come on, man. Gooden is hearing all this, trying to conduct an interview, pretending not to hear. Right. Now, Gooden is my friend. I've known him since 84, almost 10 years. He just met Benia. He don't, hardly knows Benia. And Dwight was so unnerved by the, the, the growing tension between me and Benia that he pulls out a brush and starts brushing his head. Now, that year he was bald. He shaved his head. So he said, brushing his bald head. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know what I kind of pitch up. I mean, he was completely coming apart. Meanwhile, Benia is getting more and more aggressive. And he says, you blankety blank. And he said, he called me a name that I could not ignore. Could not ignore. So I put the notebook in my back pocket. I circle around behind the group. And I go right up to Benia. Because he says to me, come on, man, I'll hurt you. I go right up to him. Now, we're no stiff to no stiff now, okay? I said, you want to fight? Now, I'm it's about six feet, 195. But he is 6'4 at the time, 240. I did not like my chances. Yeah, your chances. Not like great chances. But you know, there comes a point you have to say something. So if he wanted to do something, here I am. The sports writer's right in his face. And you know what he did? Nothing. I realized the whole thing was for show. To embarrass me, to humiliate me, maybe get me to throw the first one. So he had an excuse to unload. He waited until there were five or six people who rushed to the scene, separated us, right. and said, Come on, man. I'll show you the Bronx right here. Yes. Whatever that meant. Oh, dear. He was living in Greenwich, Connecticut at the time. I don't know. <laughs> and he still so, lives in Greenwich. He still lives in Greenwich. <laughs> so that's what launched that book. Right. That's how that book made the regional New York Times bestseller list. It wasn't selling at all until it was written about it. It was written about it in the newspapers. Everybody wrote about it. Well, it, it is a good read. I, I know it's it was fun. one of your first efforts. It's a fun book. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's insightful. And I, I appreciate it. And I, uh, I see the difference between, you know, the management perspective on Inside the Empire. And uh, I think you've done some really great work. I read your stuff all the time. Thank you. Many people in, in our area do. Um, and I want to thank you for taking the time today to share as a Leonian with other Leonians what your experience in high school was like. I love the part about NEC, uh, your interest in how it, you know, uh, developed. And that's what this series is all about. Interviews with prominent leonians like yourself. So Bob, thank you. Thank you for, for letting me time. get into my own time machine. Yeah. No, no worries. I, I, I really you. enjoyed it. Thank you. And, uh, I look forward to you know uh, spending more time with you. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thanks.